Israelis and diaspora Jews predominantly to find new ways to do business with each other. We'll be hearing more about that later. Uh, we're here today because there's a great combination of Linux and the General Assembly of the Jewish Federation is happening at the same time. And there are two different strap lines that you would have seen. One is the strap line of this Limur conference, which is uh, the shared destiny of the Jewish people, and the other is we need to talk, which is the, the General Assembly. So what are these two threads and why have they brought us here? I don't want to ruin anyone else's speeches, but in brief, I think one of the things that we've all felt in our own ways is that there's something of a miscommunication between the way that Israelis feel their lives are going and the way that Israel is perceived by a lot of people in the diaspora. And a lot of the, the miscommunication, the missing link in knowledge is around our socioeconomic realities. So what we're going to try to do today in, in three different ways is to, to bridge that knowledge gap a little bit and try and evaluate why that's occurred and what we can do to make sure that things change in the future and what the reasons are for making that change. What difference would it make to Israel if American Jews really understand the situation here and found new ways to involve themselves in Israel? Uh, how would it help American Jews as American Jews? What difference would it make on a day-to-day -day basis for Israelis if Americans were seriously involved in the economy at the level that they're capable of? So there's, there's some fairly meaty questions that we'd like to try and, and, and ask here. Um, so a very brief introduction to who we have on the panel. So this is Professor Abi Weiss, who is the uh, chief executive. I think it's president. Let's go president. President of the Taub Institute. <laughs> and, and he will be giving us something of an overview of Israel's current state behind the headlines that are familiar to most diaspora Jews. What are the day-to-day -day existential threats for the average Israeli? Uh, and how, are we, how close are we to fixing them? What are the core concerns of Israelis that the audience may be less aware of, particularly around education, governance, competition? We have a, a replacement here. This is <laughs> Sir Oren Chamov, who's the principal at Hanako Venture Capital, which is a $300 million fund in, uh, on the Israeli uh, VC scene. Uh, unfortunately, our original speaker can't be with it due to some uh, family uh, issues. And uh, last but not least, uh, Joanna Landau, who uh, is the founder of Vibe Israel. Uh, and, uh, oh, I should say, what Alon will be covering, what well, Oren will be covering. Uh, is what Israeli and diaspora business leaders can really learn from each other, how to connect the startup nation economy to the rest of, of the Israeli economy, <coughs> and where the next opportunities lie in Israel for investors. Joanna Landau is the founder of Fight Israel, and she'll be looking more at how to engage diaspora jury with Israel beyond conventional methods, connecting people through their personal interests, which in this context is the involvement in the understanding of socioeconomics and why it's important to should we say the news items? Uh, and at the end, I'll present a little bit about myself as well. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to Professor White. Thank you, um, Well, thank you for inviting me, and, uh, and thank you all for coming. So let me tell you just a drop about you know, the Taub Center, who we are. Uh, we're a socioeconomic think tank. We've been in existence since 1982, and we take a look at all issues that deal with socioeconomic society of concern with the welfare of citizens. We look at health, we look at education, we look at welfare, we look at labor markets, we look at macroeconomic policy, basically at prices inside of Israel. Basically we're trying to understand what it is that's going right, what is that's going wrong inside the country. We are neutral brokers, we, uh, we are seen as such, um, as being honest brokers, as being completely neutral. We do not do anything political, we never touch anything in order to keep neutral. In Israel you have to, to stay away from politics. And uh, we are very successful in doing that. The result being that all political parties, all Knesset members, all ministries uh, consult with us, speak with us, want to hear what we've done, take a look at our research, use our research, uh, invite us to speak in their commi committees, and, uh, and that's who we are, and that's what we do. Um, we put out some very, very interesting publications throughout the entire year. We have a new piece coming out uh, tomorrow. It's going to the press. It'll be open uh, on Wednesday. And, uh, and we put out our, 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 mo our, our most popular publication is this one right here, which a bunch of copies of it have been put outside on the tables, so you're all welcome to, uh, to take a copy. And it's basically a one page, uh, each page is one, one graph and one story, and it's written as a continuous story throughout the entire book. So what Michael asked me to do was tell you a little bit, as he said, tell you a little bit about um, you know, the problems faced by Israelis and what, how they view the world, what it is that's important to them, what keeps them up, what keeps them thinking, what keeps them, what keeps them worried. And uh, the answer is not going to be very different than it is anywhere else in the world. What, what people are really the most interested in is their own welfare, is their own pocketbook, is what's going on by them, 
by their community, by their, by, by their city. That's what's important to them. And, uh, and a lot of issues which may be important to many other people, uh, as uh, Nathan said earlier, uh, are not necessarily in the, folk, in, the, in the center of their focus. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run you through a number of things that are very important to Israelis and just try to give a, a slight picture of what the issue is. So what I'm going to do is take you back uh, seven years. I'm going to take you back to 2011. Now in 2011, for those of you who were here and even for those who were not here, you may remember there was a very, very big social protest that broke out in the summer of 2011. It broke out over two specific issues. What were the issues, remember? Kaddish. Well, Kaddish was actually the second. But what was the first? House. The first was housing. So the first one was, was, the, was the housing issue, the difficulty in purchasing housing, and the second one was Kaddish, which was basically a sign of prices in general inside of Israel. Kaddish was the thing that contributed, but it became a whole issue of prices inside of Israel um, and, 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 how, and why are prices so high inside of Israel. So basically, it's a real, it's a real you know, simple story. It's a story of socioeconomics. It's a story of how well off you are. And while I'm going to tell you that there has been some significant improvement over the past number of years, Israeli income has grown very, very nicely over the past three, four years. Prices in Israel are actually coming down over the past three, four years, certainly relative to other countries, but even absolutely they're, uh, they're coming down. Um, I'm still going to tell you where the problems lie and where the issues lie. So there's, there's always, and all of this is mixed in, a lot of good news and a lot of bad news, but altogether it's a, it's a very, very uh, complicated uh, story. So let's think about a person's, that, 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 that strike, that, uh, that protest in 2011. So you've got two sides of the equation. One side of the equation is the income side, and the other side of the equation is the expenditure side. You know, in order to feel good about how you, you're doing socioeconomically, you think about in real terms what you're able to do with the income that you have. So when we start with income, um, obviously the thing you go through first is poverty. Now, poverty inside of Israel, it's defined in a specific way throughout the entire uh, world except the United States. And, um, and poverty, when measured in Israel, you find that from a disposable income perspective, the amount of money people get into their bank account every month from their jobs, Israel is the last, in last place, has the highest poverty rate of any developed country. That's not a really good starting point, right? 18% um, of families in Israel are below the poverty line. Uh, that's a lot more, the average in the, in the developed countries is 11%. And this is significantly more than that. Now, if you go to specific populations, zoom in a little bit, and you go to the ultra-Orthodox population, it's 45%. If you go to the Arab population, it's actually 49%. So we're talking about very, very significant portions of the population and some specific populations that are living in relative poverty, okay? That doesn't mean that they don't have food to put on their tables but it does mean that they are not doing nearly as well as, uh, as their neighbors, as the people that surround them. Um, now you might ask, you know, how is that possible? I mean, Israel is, is the startup nation, right? We are the startup nation. We are an incredibly strong economy and, and it's doing really, really well and there are all these people who are making a lot of money and that's really true. But the problem is that this is very much a two-sector economy. And when I say two-sector economy, I'm talking about the high tech and everything else. Okay, just to make it really, really simple. Now, the high tech, Israel has a higher percentage of workers in high tech than any other developed country, any other country. It's about 8 to 9%. Well, that means you have about 91 to 92% that aren't working there. And uh, the difference in salaries between the high tech on average and the rest of the economy on average, high tech people on average earn two and a half times as much as people not in the high tech. There's nowhere else that's even close to that number. The highest elsewhere is about 1.8. Nobody else is even close to that number. And it happens for very specific reasons, which I don't have time to go into, into but it is certainly something that when you're thinking about, um, you know, what Israelis are thinking about, so you have 90% of the population thinking about the fact that they really are not earning very, very high wages. That's an exaggeration, because even there, there's obviously a big distribution, but still you're getting the idea that there's a big disparity inside of Israel. Well. Mm -hmm. Let's move over to the expenditure side. So the expenditure side, of course, we can talk about housing. Housing in Israel is expensive. It's become incredibly expensive in the past decade. It started in about 2007, 2008. Since then, prices have been going up steadily, an average of about 2% more than 
inflation has been going up over over the entire period. Uh, two percent more than I'm sorry than than, uh, than uh, rental has been going up. But over the entire period, you take a look over that ten-year period, you're going to see that the real price of housing pretty much doubled. Okay, that's that, that's a rough, but somewhere around doubled. Now that's an incredibly high increase. It happened for reasons we understand, that we know what needs to be done in order to alleviate it. Um, whatever you do to alleviate it, it takes a lot of time. Housing is a market that, in order to really get the, the solve the problem, you need to create more housing, and creating more housing takes time. There's nothing you can do about it. It's not going to be an, an, uh, an instant uh, solution. No matter what, what they do, it's not going to be an instant solution. So let's go to other prices. Price levels in Israel, I told you, have been improving significantly. They've been going down. And yet, prices in Israel are on average 14% higher than in the developed countries. Now, it's not just that it's 14% higher, it's higher in every single country except for Chile. Um, now, that's, again, not a really, really good uh, sign. Um, this comes from the com competitive structure within Israel. And the competitive structure within, within Israel is that it's a small country, so you don't have much competition within the country. And it's a country that protects, has a lot of protectionism, and therefore you don't have as much as you need competition coming from outside the country for many, many types of industries. For other types of industries, you do. So these are things that, 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 that very much concern the Israeli pocket. The other thing that concerns the Israeli pocket is, of course, health care. Um, health care in Israel um, is, is really quite, considered quite good. Certainly at the primary level, it's considered excellent. Uh, but there's been a shift in, uh, in how people finance the health, their, their health care. So in the United States, people tend to pay for a lot of health care by themselves. In most uh, European countries, that's not the case. In most European countries, in most uh, developed countries, the government uh, takes on themselves the burden of most of the health care. Of course, it comes from taxpayers, but, 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 but the government actually uh, foots the most. Israel's right in the middle. And it's moving more and more towards less government and more private. And part of that is being done uh, through expenditures on, uh, on private insurance. Now, the private insurance companies uh, made a lot of money by calling people and saying, you really don't need insurance for A, B, C, D. There are many people who purchased the same insurance multiple times without realizing that they had done that. So there's been quite a lot of expenditure on public insurance. There's a lot of work on trying to crack down on that type of behavior. But it's a hard thing to do. Um, so those are some of the things that are happening inside of Israel. I'm going to give you one more. And I'm going to talk a little bit to you about demographics. And Michael, you'll tell me how much time I have and cut me off whenever you want. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, about demographics. Um, we know that in Israel we have two very, very special populations that behave somewhat differently than the rest of the, of the, uh, of the population. Those are the ultra-Orthodox and the Arab Israelis. What's true about both of them, both of them tend to have a relatively low level of human capital which means that then when they work, they're getting relatively low wages. Second of all, only one of the family members tends to work. With the Haredi, the ultra-Orthodox, it tends to be the woman, and with the Arabs, it tends to be the man. And third, they tend to have large families. <laughs> that those three together are a wonderful, wonderful recipe for poverty, because it's really hard, if you're not earning much and you have a large family, it's hard to be able to finance that family, to, to be able to really uh, keep things flowing. Um, now, I just want to zoom in on the ultra-Orthodox, because when you're talking about things that are keeping Israelis awake at night, one of the things is the demographic changes that are happening. And this comes from fertility levels. Fertility in Israel is very high. It's 3.1 children per family, higher than any other developed country by a lot. By a lot. The average in the developed countries is 1.7. and. Um, and the thing is that, that if you divide it up by the different parts of the population, for ultra-Orthodox, the fertility rate is 6.9 children per family. Now, 6.9 is a lot of children. And what it means is that the Haredi, ultra-Orthodox part of the population, is growing. Now, that might not be a concern if it weren't for the fact that they really do behave differently from a labor force perspective, from the type of education that they get. and the question is how that projects forward. Now, if you take a look today, you would see that in the ultra-Orthodox communities, almost 50% of the ultra-Orthodox are below the age of 14. That's really young. And, and that means that this is growing over time. 
and the ability to continue for them to continue financing themselves um, in a situation where they're growing rapidly and they don't have the income is something that's going to become really problematic. So their parents were able to somehow help them get apartments. I question how they're going to be able to do that for their children. That's going to be something that's become much, much more difficult. Um, but changes are happening. And the changes are that they are also realizing this, that they understand that things are, are changing inside of their economy, and more of them are starting to get education, and more of them are going to the labor force. And the question is how fast it's happening and how fast it will happen. We have a lot of work that we've done on this, but, um, but let's just say that there's more schooling. For instance, for among the ultra-Orthodox, the number of people who registered for higher education for colleges and universities uh, tripled over a six-year period. The problem is 58% of them didn't finish their studies. In other words, so many more started, but they didn't all finish their studies. And therefore, the increase is not as large as you might want it to be, you might expect it to be. Uh, actually, the population that's really increased their education a lot more is uh, Arab Israeli women, who are also very much not just studying uh, a lot more than in the past, but they're studying a lot more computers and mathematics and physics than in the past. The problem is they're doing it during high school, and when they get to college and when they get to careers, they're going back into education and not sticking with high tech. That's something that the high tech uh, world has to think about, how to draw in more people into more, more Arab Israelis, especially the women who are incredible, how to draw them into the, into, uh, into the employment inside of those, uh, inside of those uh, areas. So I, I, I think that's probably more than enough. I've probably taken more time than I was supposed to take. But uh, so there's a lot going on, okay? Israelis are concerned about the same things that Americans are concerned about when you're not thinking about Israel. Okay, and you're concerned about what's going on in your own lives. Thank you very much. So when asked how the Israeli business community can best connect with the diaspora community and what one group can learn from the other, the first thing I thought is Israel does an excellent job through business connecting with not only the diaspora Jewish community, but I think all foreign communities, right? Not just the Jewish community. I think in business throughout the world, Israel is recognized, respected, and embraced for who Israel is today. And I think particularly in the diaspora Jewish community, when you take a look at how folks relate to Israel, be it policy or be it through religion, a lot of people look at Israel for what it ought to be or to project what they'd like to see from Israel. So from a business perspective, it's an excellent framework to just embrace Israel for who the country is today. Now, some things that I actually think folks abroad, particularly in the States, can learn from the Israeli business community is Israeli business women and Israeli business men embrace the government. It's completely different than, I think, in the United States, where folks kind of have a seesaw approach of the role that government should be playing in the private sector, is on the one hand, you have folks that are libertarians saying, I don't want anything to do with government. And on the other hand, you have folks saying, bring on more government, we want more control, we want them more involved. In Israel, there's a tremendous amount of nuance. Israelis recognize and embrace the role that government can play in spurring the economy and boosting their businesses. So three quick examples come to mind of this. The first example of Israelis embracing the government to boost their business is, I would start with, um, sorry about that. Um, I would start with the fact of the Israeli economic missions abroad. Israel, does is the government sends folks abroad, government officials, to promote Israeli companies, to be ambassadors for what they do. Everyone, most folks are familiar with Mobileye success, a $15 billion exit to Intel. But how did Mobileye secure its first customer? Through a government official, the Israeli economic mission in Germany, introducing Mobileye without any customers to BMW about nine years ago, forever changing the course of that business. BMW as a customer, you can go and see anybody. On another hand, you have the Israeli government actively spurring new innovation hubs. So speaking of the distribution of wealth, the Israeli government recognizes that, that this is a problem. And I actually think that both the government getting involved and venture capitalists, such as Hanako and a bunch of other funds, are looking to create new innovation hubs outside of Tel Aviv. And I think learning from the United States, where New York and LA have emerged with their own identity as tech hubs, 
in the United States and not as Silicon Valley 2.0. New York built its tech economy on the advertising agencies that were there and our leaders in marketing technology. LA, the consumer hub of America, where you can find per capita the most startups, the most consumer e-commerce businesses, and where you can also find the most social media companies, right? Snapchat being the most recognized of that group. So I think Israel's recognized that if we want to create more innovation hubs so that 9% that are in the tech labor force, that number can improve so we can redistribute that wealth and have more people involved. It's building in the north where it's a food and agriculture tech hub where plenty of VCs spend time, but it was spurred by the government in the first place. Where Haifa is doing a phenomenal job built on the technium primarily in developing hardware technology and healthcare leaning on the hospitals. And lastly, Bercev is probably the prime example of this, where the government is investing in Ben-Gurion University, moving much of military intelligence down south, and giving tremendous tax breaks to foreign companies. One example is Lockheed Martin, to open an office down south, to open their headquarters uh, in Israel there, is to spur Bercev to be the cybersecurity hub of Israel. So the government is being very proactive in redistributing that wealth, and Israelis are embracing that as well. And I think folks abroad tend to look at the government as super helpful or absolutely the worst thing. And in Israel, they recognize that it can help open doors, but it's on the entrepreneurs themselves to get through them and to build their own businesses and not rely on the government. And lastly, another example where you could find the government does a great job helping the tech sector is I have to thank, I think, the government for my job ultimately. In the mid-90s, the government started what was called the Yotzma program, which incentivized domestic Israeli venture capital funds for every dollar you raise abroad, we'll match it with another dollar. From that point, it, the Israeli venture community has boomed. And I think something that the Israeli community can learn from the states are how to build succession plans. So when you have a new generation of entrepreneurs looking for a new generation of investors, the first folks in the venture community who benefited from the venture funding from the government should be bringing on some younger folks, not to just be here to boost uh, jobs for my friends, but um, that they should be embracing generational change as well. So I think Israelis embrace the government, and I think that Americans and all sorts of diaspora Jewry can find uh, a way to include the government in their business plans as well. Michael, can I take this off? Oh, yeah. I'm going to ruin your little thing here. Sorry, I, I don't like being behind podiums, so I'm going to take it off. You need it anyway, right? Afterwards. Okay. I'm going to keep this on here. Right? Is that okay? No, it's okay. I have to walk around with this thing? Okay. Hi, everyone. And now for something completely different. Um, so I'm Joanna Landau. I'll give you a little bit of background because I have my mother and my grandmother in the audience and I really should mention that. <laughs> very important. Uh, but it's, it, it's very, very relevant. My uh, family has been supportive of Israel since uh, the 1960s, I think, right? Since the 1960s. Um, my parents came to live in Israel 40 odd years ago. Uh, I'm Israeli. I don't sound Israeli, but I am. And I've lived here most of my life. Uh, when my parents brought me to Israel, they basically made the choice for me. And when I was a teenager, I sort of didn't quite find myself here, so I went to a Jewish boarding school uh, back in England, came back to the army, and that's when I connected with Israel. That's where I felt Israel was going to be the home for me. And my husband had a very similar kind of uh, experience, and he's American and Israeli. So we have three children in Israel. Each one of our children hello, <laughs> have three passports. Okay, they have an Israeli passport by virtue of being born here, a British passport, which until recently was a European passport and may even actually happen, uh, and an American passport. So there's a, a saying in Hebrew, the first in America, meaning uh, you've done extremely well, you've, you've caught America. They have pretty much all the options in the world where to live. Uh, but they choose to live here because I choose that for them, right, and my husband. And the question is, my question that I asked myself about 10 years ago when I was in business and I'm a lawyer, I asked myself, when they finish the army, what choice will they make? They'll look at their three passports and will they say Israel, okay? And I think that this is an existential question and existential threats and I'm actually quite a positive person, so thank you, Dr. Weiss, for depressing me completely and thank you for talking about the government. But uh, the way I look at it is, 
How am I going to make sure that my children view Israel in a very positive way to the extent that it's attractive and relevant to them and they will want to continue to make their life here and connect globally as well as global citizens? I think this question is a question that the Jewish community is asking themselves about their next generation. Not just how will they connect with Israel, but how will they connect with their own Judaism. Okay? And we need to look at this very, very carefully. Now, the organization that I run and I founded is called Vibe Israel, and we are actually promoting Israel in the world as a brand. Okay? Think of Coca-Cola as a product. It needs to sell itself. What do you need to do with it? You don't go on and on about how you're actually ruin pe ruining people's teeth, but it's okay, or it's a terrible drink and it makes people obese, but it's okay. You go on and you take your best foot forward and you promote what you have to offer and you engage people through what interests them. Look at countries and cities in exactly the same way. Every country and city around the world that you've come across, most of them, have what's called a, a proper country branding or a city branding agency. Uh, point in case is the city of Tel Aviv. They have city Glo uh, Tel Aviv City Global, which uh, the purpose of the organization within the municipality is to turn Tel Aviv into an internationally attractive and relevant city. And I think we can argue, arguably say that they've done a pretty good job. What are they doing? They're engaging people through to Tel Aviv, through what? Through the gay community, through uh, all sorts of different lifestyles, the startup community, of course. That's not to say it doesn't exist in Jer Jerusalem and other places around the world, but what is interesting about Tel Aviv Global is that they've managed to find what is it about Tel Aviv that is attractive and relevant uh, to the world. We're doing the same for Israel, and I'm happy to talk about that later, but I think that what we need to understand is when we are actually living at one of the most exciting times in terms of a sort of revolution that's going on. I think it's as important as the industrial revolution and that is in the way we communicate. And I'm not talking about the internet. The internet was in the 1990s and it was great. Social media has pretty much changed the way everyone consumes information, passes information on, broadcasts information, and we as an organization have become sort of quite specialized in how do you get social media influencers who are not Jewish, have no connection with Israel at all, bring them to Israel and showcase what Israel has to offer them. And we've done a pretty good job doing that. I'm very proud of what we've achieved over the last uh, eight years. We've brought 40 delegations of social media influences to Israel with over 120 million positive mentions of Israel online, but it's not enough, okay? And I'm mentioning all of this because we're now scaling up to the national level, non-governmental, because in that respect, the government is somewhere else. Um, BDS, BDS, BDS. Okay, we'll talk about that later maybe. But I'm mentioning all of this because the Jewish community, from what I can see, and I'm mainly involved with the American Jewish community, most of our donors are from there, uh, but also other communities are all asking, how can we engage with our millennials? What can we do about the next generation? And they think that the Jewish millennial is some form of other kind of person, and they don't look at them just as a millennial. They think Jewish millennials are completely different and we need to do something very, very special in order to engage Jewish millennials. And what my message to you today, to anybody who's involved in the Jewish community abroad, and of course to Israelis in Israel, Jewish millennials are millennials, okay? And if you want to understand how to engage with the next generation, you need to understand how to engage with millennials and Gen Z. And I'll end with the first question that you need to ask with a millennial is what's in it for you? And if we can find out what's in it for millennials, Jewish millennials, the next generation to stay connected to Israel, to stay connected to their Judaism. And if we as an organization can find out what's, the, sort of what's in it for non-Jewish people to connect with Israel, I think that one of our existential threats will be at least dealt with. I don't know about the, all the rest, but at least one of them. Thank you. Uh, so, just to say a few words uh, about my own interest here. So, we started working with the Jewish federations about five years ago to try and understand why the American Jewish community had no strategic investments in Israel. So, to give you some context about the federations, for those who are not here from the, 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 the federations themselves or from the GA, there are 130 separate Jewish federations in North America who convocate into this thing called the JFNA, the Jewish Federations of North America. They have about 100 endowments between them that manage $20 billion. So it's effectively the secret Jewish sovereign wealth fund that nobody knows about unless they're really in this world and very geeky about it like I am. Out of that money, almost none of it is invested in Israel. And there are some very good reasons why not. Um, 
the people who are managing that money are obliged to create a return. That return is what is used to pay for the activities of American Jewry. However, we are now at a point where, unlike when the state began, when these endowments began, uh, where there were very volatile things you could invest in that were not appropriate. Now we have a modern Israeli economy and there's really no excuse as to why there is not a strategic investment in Israel. So we've been trying to understand why they haven't made this switch. And fundamentally, the conclusion that we came to is that they lack uh, a comprehensive understanding of the strategic importance of an investment relationship in Israel that sits alongside philanthropy and advocacy. So when we talk about government involvement in Israel, one of the things that, that was brought up at the, at the GA, one of the sessions I was in earlier, uh, is, is that American Jewry are such an effective lobby for Israel that beyond philanthropy, which stacks up to, I think, about $3 billion a year, and beyond Israel bonds, which is another $1.6 billion a year, they're also responsible for something between, we have $5 billion a year of American government aid in, in terms of defense, but there's about another $5 billion a year of other subsidies that arrive through various other governmental organizations. So American Jewry are responsible for this enormous sum of money that comes into Israel, but none of it is American Jewish invested money, almost none of it. Once you discount Israel bonds, which is a pseudo-philanthropic activity, and nobody would tell you otherwise. Just for your own information, it costs the Israeli government twice as much to borrow money from American Jews through Israel bonds as it does to just go and borrow them from non-Jewish capitalists in the marketplace. So they're paying through the nose to maintain this relationship. That's not a commercial investment. So I'm, I'm setting this scene because it gives you some un understanding of, of the enormous disconnect uh, between the realities that we face in Israel and, and how we might try and surmount those realities uh, and the way in which institutional American Jewry is approaching the subject. So I'm not going to bore you with a huge amount of technical detail, but suffice to say that what we're looking to do is create a framework whereby we can correct that anomaly. And we're, we're pushing for the American Jewish institutions led by the Jewish Federations of North America to commit a percentage of their investment capital to the Israeli economy. We believe that if you do that at a strategic level and you show the required leadership, the wave of new capital that would come into Israel and would allow us to solve some of our socioeconomic programs, uh, problems through uh, both work with the government, which we'd expect to return on, and through work in the private sector through funds such as, uh, as, as Orange at Hanako, it's an absolute game changer for Israel. Most economists will tell you that the infrastructure gap in Israel runs to the tune of $100 billion. So when we talk about, well, what would we do if American Jews suddenly started investing? Where would the money go? Believe me when I say there are plenty of places, and those of you who live in Israel will have a very good idea of the nearest place you think that some money should be deployed, whether it's in your salaries in the private sector or your resources provided to you by the public sector. So I'm, I'm not going to go into too many further details, but hopefully you've seen enough on this panel from enough different angles of this story to, to ask a few questions. And I have a couple up my sleeve if, uh, if there's, there's not any good places to start. So I'm willing to throw things open to, to the floor from here. Oh, jump. Go on. that simply a simple equation of bigger families, you're dividing that income among more people, that could be a simple explanation. Or could we also just uh, throw it out and just say, say, what is happening to the privatization sector? I mean, things like preventation of Uber kind of services coming to the country, uh, are those the things that are preventing our market from being further developed? Well, okay, there, so there are a couple of very different issues here. One is with respect to, uh, to income Per person. You don't just take the income and divide by the number of people. There's actually a formula that, that, that tells you how to do that. It comes, you know, from the old adage, you know, two can live, live for, you know, li cheaper than, 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 than two singles, right? A couple can be cheaper than two singles, and that doesn't cost twice as much for, for a couple to live as it does for two singles to live. Um, it takes that into account. There's a formula that's used. In so when you talk about uh, poverty, you're talking about the ability to, I mean, to some extent, it, it's, a, it's a relative measure, but to some extent you're talking about the ability to actually, uh, to actually live at a level which is commensurate with, with, uh, with those around you. Okay, so, so let's put it that way. With respect to Uber or things along those lines, that's what I'm talking about, increasing competition within, within Israel. The way to bring prices down inside of Israel is to lift a lot of those barriers that exist and to, and to uh, and to allow competition to do what competition does best. Now, in the case specifically of Uber, the war that happened with, with bringing Uber into Israel 
uh, is the same as happened in many other places, including in places in the United States. There are places they didn't allow Uber in because of the fact that the taxi drivers feel very, very much hurt. Just take a, the, the price of a medallion in New York. The price of a medallion in New York before Uber was about $1.2 million. Today it's about $100,000. Now, now uh, those people who own you know, those medallions and invested a lot of money in them lost their life savings, many of them. So, so you know, the question is, do you want the competition or not? I'm a competition guy, okay? So, uh, you, you know, you're barking up, the, uh, you know, we're barking up the same tree. And, and I would say on that, that the private sector can really help spur uh, distribution of wealth, because if you start a company, you, and then that company sells, you will become an investor in the local economy. Um, so what we actually find, our founders are actually our best assets for bringing us deal flow, particularly ones who've had exits, and they're just redistributing that wealth here. So I think we want there to be more private companies, we want them to be Israeli, uh, and we definitely want to see them succeed. No question. Um, slightly political question then. In Israel, the political system is based on proportional representation. Uh, as opposed to the constitution, uh, representing constituencies. Now that means that the politicians in Israel, well, the politicians in Israel represent opinions rather than people. If the system was changed in Israel, where the system was only to represent people, if, if politicians were accountable to the public rather than being accountable to the electoral committees, political leaders, or, or whatever, or rabbis, or whatever, would that have a positive influence on the economy uh, regarding prices, regarding all the topics you've, you've spoken about, if we change the system in Israel? Well. <laughs> uh, I'm going to tackle it from a slightly different angle and I'll let somebody more qualified than me talk about. Uh, the, the specifics from an economic perspective. I think in the context of, of, of the discussion of Limud and the GA and these themes as to what appears to be a, an, an ever-growing disparity between what, what diaspora Jews think and do related to Israel and how Israelis feel about, about themselves, uh, I think that the, one of the things we have to find a way to, to resolve uh, is for these interest groups to not be able to have their boot on the neck of the economy. Uh, I'm going to say something even more political than your question. I think we sit in Israel, the vast majority of us, and we worry about political Islam, and that yet we live in a country with political Judaism. Uh, and for me, that is a fundamental economic concern. So I think when we, when we understand that, that that is the reality, I'm not proposing that we simply throw Jewish values and Judaism out of the window altogether, but there has to be a point at which we understand that, that narrow interest groups should not be controlling the direction of an entire country in, in that way. Uh, and it's, it is leading to, I think the irony that I find is it leads to a disparity in the way that government resources are distributed, which is more goes to them, but it also is trapping them in a cycle of poverty. So one of the things that we've looked at, for example, is, is that the Haredi community and the Arab community are historically underbanked. And what it means is the fact that they don't have bank accounts, the fact they do so much in the cash economy, which at the time seems very clever for them because it's less tax to pay when you do that, but it means they can't get mortgages, it means they can't establish a credit rating, it means that they can't go and, and set up a business in a conventional way that can expand. And they end up trapped in that cycle, so it actually ends up damaging them and, and simply making them dependent, and the rest of us pay for that. And it's, it's a hidden cost to, to, to that political reality. So my, my view is that, that, that we have to find a way to, to undo that. Okay, so A, um, I mentioned th at the head of this thing that we don't do politics. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving my seat as, as, uh, as the, uh, as part of the Tower Center and, and just talking to you as an economist in general. Um, I, I mean, my understanding of the, of the problem that, that exists in Israeli politics is, uh, comes from, from the system, okay, in that, not, not so much that, that whether it's representative or not, but more with respect to having a parliamentary system in a country that is so evenly divided down the middle regarding the, uh, the issue that is most important to most Israelis in elections, which is you know, politics. And, um, and what happens is that you have a lot of very, very small coalitions, and each small coalition has, it has you know, you don't have any large parties anymore. And, and in order to form a coalition, you have to appease a lot of different parties. And to appease the parties, you find yourself in a situation you, where you have where the small parties have a lot of uh, political strength. Um, that has effects. 
that has friends. So I'm still sitting on two passports, and as you say, we don't know how worthless or not one of them is going to be shortly. Uh, but, but when I look at, at, at my own future here, I'm now nine years into my Aliyah, and I'm looking at what will happen if I ever have kids. What, what, wh where will I want them to grow up, really? Where will they want to grow up? And once I step a, a, around the issues of, say, do I want my kids to serve in the IDF? Um, how much are they going to struggle financially? I, I see these more deep societal issues. I see the income disparities, and I see uh, that the actually the place that has this better than us, and the place where, you know, it's the running joke, as you say, like, the, where do Israelis want to go? They want to go to America. It's partly because actually a lot of the things that, that Israelis see is how successful American Jews are. And American Jews are so overwhelmingly more successful than the average American. The statistics are absolutely incredible. Two and a half times as much uh, household income, three times as much uh, net worth. Uh, absolutely incredible statistics. So no wonder they want to go to America. Uh, and then I look at what we have here, and, and as has been said by, by some real leading lights, it, by many measures, Israel is the least successful Jewish community in the world. We have the highest rate of poverty. We have uh, one of the lowest rates of disposable income. We're able to contribute the least to charity. We have, or, or, there are so many metrics by which we're not doing it right. And when I look at our relationship with, with diaspora Jewish, especially the American Jewish community, and I see that, and we've, we've talked about this, and Oren talked about this in particular, it's almost like we're each holding the solution to the problems of the other. And for me, it's about trying to shift the whole dynamic of this relationship into the 21st century in a way that engages millennials because it's a less political, more exciting language to talk about startups and to also talk about the real economy and the real problems that we have within it. It seems to me to be a, a, a method of, of capturing a, a lot more ground than anything else I've seen uh, in, in the attempt to, to, to realize a modern Zionism. What is your answer to that question? What have you identified as the leading uh, feeling of passion, of strength of Israel that you are branding Israel as? I'd love to be involved in that conversation. Okay, so 10 years ago, the Israeli Foreign Ministry started the Brand Israel Project, okay? Um, the idea was, how do you brand the country just like you brand a product or a company and so on? Uh, 10 years ago, they came up with a concept called creative energy. But Israel is all about a creative energy the entrepreneurial zeal, the vibrant diversity of the people, the looking for the future, which underpinning that is tikkun olam, and so on and so forth. Uh, we, I've been doing it uh, kind of with the foreign ministry all along, uh, and the foreign ministry doesn't quite uh, kind of exist anymore, let's say that in the nicest possible way, unfortunately. Um, and we kind of reviewed that uh, again, 10 years later, and we looked at what is it that uh, can really represents something which Israel truly is and which is engaging for millennials around the world, Jewish or non-Jewish. Um, one of the very, very important uh, conditions are that the idea that we come up with, and we're calling it the central idea, is that it has to be unique. No other country has it, okay? So when you think about creativity, uh, 10 years ago that was very unique for a country. This, now, everybody wants to be the most creative place on earth, most creative city and so on. So if you take creative energy, you have to drop creative. You are left with energy. And then the question becomes, which is quite good, it's okay, but it's not very emotional, okay? And the question is, what is the emotion that you feel when you're filled with the energy that Israel infuses you with when you engage with it? We did workshops and so on, and we came up with something which uh, we will not publish, 
<laughs> uh, you don't really say it. It's like asking Coca-Cola what they're, you know, uh, what they, they represent. But we came up with the term alive. So when you connect with Israel, you feel alive. You feel alive because you have experienced death around you. It's not all positive. Uh, you feel alive because the way Israelis celebrate life is very, very different to other countries around the world. It's actually even very different to Jewish communities around the world. We have a different way of being Jewish here. And of course, Israel is 20% not Jewish as well. Uh, we feel alive in the way that we live together. So uh, we're working with consultants who are working with other countries around the world, including Australia, Costa Rica, Paraguay, and so on. They use the term coexistence. And I said, no, 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 you don't understand. We can't say coexistence. That only means Arabs and Jews. They were talking about the way we all live together, secular and religious, um, you know, people who just made Aliyah and people who've always lived, already lived here. Of course, Arab and Jews and so on. Uh, so we talk about that. We're talking about the way that we celebrate life through the way we move forward. How Israelis, how are they looking at changing the world? It's very different. One of the reasons why we have such a great startup economy is not just this wonderful sort of Jewish, uh, um, you know, uh, ability. It's also that there's just no market here and we want to go big. So there are all these different ways of turning what the alive central idea into marketing messaging. And when I say this, every other country is doing it. Israel isn't, unfortunately. So we're trying to get more people involved. As a, as a branding professional, which I assume you are, uh, you'll understand the, the terminology that we're using. It's very, actually, much simpler than trying to convince the world that they're all wrong about BDS or that there's delegitimization going on. Good answer. Okay. One more question. Matt. Money and investment capital There's a number of challenges that that presents. Uh, three quick ones. Dangerous region, missiles flying overhead and whatnot, the war all the time. Um, the shekel is not the reserve currency, it's not the euro dollar, it's not even something you know, uh, by China. Um, it, 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 in the past five years, I think it's been a 15% uh, fluctuation against the, the reserve currency, at least against the dollar. Um, so it's not someplace where a serious investor necessarily would want to place funding. Um, and the third is the banking system here, which uh, is, as everyone here who's had to deal with an Israeli bank knows, is something between antiquated and, uh, and gut-wrenching. Um, so while, while I, I on some level agree with you, and, and yes, the money from the Federation coming in is, would certainly be nice, but let's take it even bigger, just in general, outside investment coming from, let's call it Western, Western or even Anglo world, how do you overcome those challenges, um, and what can be what can be done to, to, to make Israel a more attractive place for that? We may all have some opinion on this. Um, I, I'm I'm going to put it in very simple terms. I think that the, the problem that we have here is is a, a bunch of scale issues all stacked on top of each other. So the issue is that to make this to make it interesting for investors, you need a lot of them to act at once. It's also better when those investors are friendly investors who are willing to tackle systemic issues as part of the deal who recognize that there is value, both financial and impactful, that might be unlocked by doing so. I'll give you an example. Uh, separate the banking, because there are issues with it. But take, for example, the stock market. <coughs> the stock market in Israel is largely illiquid. We still have layers of holding companies, even though it was slightly reduced, that is still way more than everywhere else. It's hugely off-putting for foreign investors. If you have a look at how much foreign capital sits in the Israeli stock market, about 70% of the capital is provided by Israeli institutions of what's left, about half of it is, is Israel-related, friendly institutions, and only about 15% of it is genuinely outsiders who want exposure to the Israeli economy, and, and that's a pretty poor state of affairs. If you look at any other small but 